2020. Apagora invited art students and doctoral researchers to investigate the shifting borders of water and land in the pre symposium event in Turku archipelago called the Census of Seili. The pre symposium was a research retreat directed by the curator and researcher Taru Elfing from CAA, Contemporary Art Archipelago, and organized in collaboration with the Sea Research, sea research Profile Area and the Archipelago Research Institute of Turku on the island of Seili. Taru Elfing, at the very end of the table, uh, the leader of the Census of Seili. She's a curator and writer based in Helsinki, but has her strong roots in Turku. In fact, she studied with me art history at the same time. Her practice focuses on the site-sensitive investigations at the intersections of ecological, feminist, and decolonial thought. She is currently developing a multidisciplinary platform for artistic research with the Archipelago Sea Research Institute of Turku University. She has an impressive history of wide range of international curatorial practices and projects. And now Taro Elfing will present the members of the research retreat, John Bjerkman, Alexandra Yachenko, Selina Oaks, Alex Rennes, Ulla Valovesi, and Kari Yliannala. Please welcome Taru Elfing and the Senses of Seili. Kiitos, Taina. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's always great to come back to Turku, um, where my roots really um, are. Um, I'll do a very, very brief uh, introduction to the pre-symposium, and then I'll let the members of the group, you know, the kind of participants of this pre-symposium, uh, to present um, their questions and approaches, um, and, and also kind of um, introduce their first um, thoughts uh, based on these two very intense days that we had, had in Seili. And, uh, and to start with also, we are, um, this is a, we were in Seili on Monday and Tuesday, um, and so it was very, we had very, very uh, interesting, inspiring and, and meandering um, uh, conversations there. And so you can only imagine that we can only really give you very immediate and tip of the iceberg kind of impressions, you know, with this very little time of reflection since then. Um, and uh, um, so maybe briefly to those of you who don't know the island of Seili, um, some of you were probably here in the presentation yesterday of the uh, other uh, project, the uh, Island of Life um, research project. Um, but uh, so Seili is, is an island in a in sort of um, inner archipelago uh, sea of, of Turku uh, archipelago, and, um, and it has a very, very long and complex history of, of um, institutions um, on the island. Um, so um, our approach uh, to Seili was really to propose for the pre-symposium participants uh, that we approached kind of Seili as a kind of microcosm, where this uh, natural cultural, um, and again I would specify not natural and cultural, but natural cultural, entangled histories and, and changes are very much um, also in the present. Um, there's uh, this history of institutions and practices of care and control, uh, of othering and boundary making, uh, from state and church uh, to hospital, um, and, and now scientific um, practices. Um, what's present there very much so too are environmental changes. As we all know that the Archipelago Sea and the Baltic Sea is in, is in quite a dramatic change. Uh, climate change is having a very severe impact on this sort of quite a small uh, inner sea that has very particular uh, ecosystem due to low salinity um, and, uh, and it's also a very young sea only uh, since the ice age, last ice age. Um, so um, we were also kind of uh, taking as a starting point um, these kind of changes that are present um, in this context. Um, the geological time frame of changes, uh, the kind of in, that sort of very um, uncertain boundary between water and land, um, also agricultural and conservation um, changes in the histories of, of human presence there, 
have a, have a kind of presence in, in complex ways. Uh, and of course now, climate change, and more and more awareness of how climate change is also having an impact. Um, also, we wanted to approach Sailly as an island that reminds us that nothing is an island. Um, so the island um, is always um, here. It's very concretely as part of an archipelago. It's very closely connected to other islands and to the mainland. Um, but also, um, it's not only connected within the local context, the local uh, different flows um, across the waters, uh, but also to planetary um, forces and planetary um, sort of patterns of change that are happening and, uh, and these sort of cycles um, of, again, uh, water and air, for example. Um, and so our, um, the points of question that we kind of proposed in the beginning uh, within this sort of how do we um, enter this island and what do we do as a group of researchers who all come from quite different disciplines and different research questions. Um, so we propose this question of how, how do we bring our research and uh, questions and methodologies to this particular place? Um, how do we make sense of Sailly? Um, how to make sense? How to sense? Um, what is sensible, sensorial? to us, um, and how do we situate our practices and knowledges here? Um, how do we think with and in a place? Um, as Isabel Stengers, um, a philosopher of science, uh, writes, the thinking happen always happens in a place. And what does it mean to think in this place and to think together uh, in this place and time? And how do we think with others and these other situated knowledges and partial perspectives, as Donna Haraway would say, of these different disciplinary positions, but also just different research uh, perspectives. Um, and how are we part of the changes that are taking place here now? How have we always already had an impact, even before we arrive? And what do we leave behind? Um, so these were just to kind of set up some of the core questions that, um, that sort of hovered around uh, on the background of our conversations and, and kind of uh, introductions or sort of um, um, first, for some of us, first encounters and for some of us, returns to the island. Um, but now I would like all the uh, participants to introduce their own research briefly and, and their questions in a way as points of entry uh, to Sailly and to our conversations. And, and we'll start with Alexandra, who can also uh, give a little bit of background to uh, the little performative action that we did in the beginning. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for, for this event. I'm very grateful that I participated in pre-symposium and symposium, and I'm very happy to give this short presentation now. My name is Alexandra. I'm an artist, sometimes curator, and currently I'm a PhD candidate at Tallinn University and here in Abo Academy in Turku. And I'm doing my research in frame of the project Put Space Public Transport as Public Space. And in particular, my focus is affective atmospheres on public transport and how these atmospheres might be transformed through artistic practice, uh, namely through performances or any kind of public art interventions. Um, I use the concept of atmosphere uh, as it was introduced by German philosopher Gernd Böhme. And he understood atmosphere as a certain relationship between environment, between physical and sensorial qualities of environment, and our own perception of these qualities. And um, however, this concept is, is not new. Even in our everyday speech, we constantly refer that this place might have a certain atmosphere or ambience or feeling or vibe or something which is literally in the air, but something that we could feel. And, um, uh, the question of atmosphere um, was one of the main I have while during this pre-symposium. I have to say that it was my first time when I was visited the island of Sely and Archipelago Sea, and of course it was a very uh, special experience for me. 
However, uh, the island of Sally is not the first island I worked with as an artist. On this particular slide, you see me dancing on the shore of the Lake Baikal um, uh, by in eastern Siberia, nearby from Irkutsk city, where I'm originally from. And um, Baikal Lake is one of the biggest, deepest, and the most ancient lake in the world, and the biggest tank of fresh drinking water. And there is uh, also an island, um, Alhon Island, one of the biggest islands uh, on Baikal area. And I was lucky to spend lots of times there, and also I worked with that territory as an artist. This is the overview of the, of the island, which is not just a beautiful nature place, it's a populated uh, place. There are villages, it has a long history, including some dramatical elements, because it was a, a, one of the places of Gulag uh, imprisonment during Soviet time. And also this island is a, one of the main holy places for Siberian shamanism and local Buddhism. So it's definitely a special place. And my task as an artist and curator uh, was to um, approach this place from artistic perspective and try to understand what kind of atmosphere this island may have. And together with other artists from Irkutsk, from that city where I'm from, we tried to uh, tackle the atmosphere of this ephemeral substance through art, using different media such as painting, photos, objects, and other elements. Particularly, I myself did this installation uh, when I used um, Petri dishes. It's a special dishes which are used in chemi chemistry laboratories for evaporating water and for researching water. And I used this, um, let's say, scientific medium in art installations. Um, when I when I was accepted for this uh, pre-symposium in Abogora, I started thinking more deeply about water. And uh, in my mind, I remember one information I got in, uh, somewhere in the internet, that if you pour water from one glass to another up for 40 times and more, you can first transform the chemical state of this water by enriching it uh, with air. And also, you could charge this water with your own uh, mental energy, because while you are doing this, you could think about something. And your thoughts, they somehow will uh, transform, uh, kind of will charge this water. So I was, uh, I was curious about that. I did this procedure myself using um, Zoom uh, web camera and kind of uh, make a reference to early performances of the 1960s. And while I was doing that, I noticed that water uh, visually changed. It, be it became more like a plasma. And I'm very happy that my colleagues supported this idea. And I'm very happy that we had the chance to make the performance now. And uh, I'm grateful for the audience for sharing this experience with us. Um, by this performance, probably I wanted to emphasize the, the presence of water in our everyday reality because we encounter it um, on a daily basis without thinking about it that deeply. And this simple, empty, and seemingly meaningless action probably could emphasize uh, the beauty of everyday reality and the importance of such substance as water. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jon Björkman, uh, and I'm a doctoral student in folkloristics at Olbo Academy University. I'm studying places, uh, the kind of places that have been held as magical, revered, scary, or even sacred by people before. We just heard a very interesting presentation by Karina Koski about the nature spirits and I'm trying to look for the places where the nature spirits are, because it's been well known that people knew the places, and I try to look if, if it's still possible to find them. Uh, 
my material consists of uh, archival material mostly, or that is the, the initial point. I have located information above, of about 90 sites that have been held as sacred or that have had some kind of rituals connected to them or where people have believed that spirits, ghosts or maybe even the devil has appeared. Next I try to look for patterns in what is their place in the um, ordered society, in the ordered landscape of the time when the people had, did have these beliefs and that is the village society and I've been using old village maps. And then how do they fit into the kind of ecology of that village and what has happened, what kind of changes have affected the beliefs and the sites and maybe what kind of cultural, ecological changes have happened that have made people forget about these sites in, in more later times. And then finally I visit the places. So I look in archives, I find information about places, then I try to locate them on old village maps and see if there is an order, if there is some kind of a pattern, are they in, in where in the village these magical or, or spirit-haunted places are. And then finally I also visit the places and try to see if I can start to identify them, how I experience them and if there are any traits which are typical for them. The element of water has shown itself to be very, very uh, prevalent in not all of the sites, but in a very large percentage. Out of the 90 places, 64 have a connection to water, and 47, that is more than half, are actually water bodies of some kind. And uh, maybe the most uh, prevalent group are the sacred springs from which people uh, went to fetch magical water for healing or for other ritual purposes, for example, to foresee their future. And it is often mentioned as a pilgrimage when you walk to a sacred spring. Um, Seili is in the middle of the sea and connected to the water also, and, and we were asked to, to tell about what kind of insights or thoughts did we have from our visit to Seili. Uh, I think it felt like a pilgrimage to me. We, a small group of, of artists and researchers from different fields, went together on a boat, took a quite long journey, and then when we were, we were on this secluded island, but many people come to Seili. I was even astonished by the amount of people that came and went, so there is something that draws them there today, in the culture that we have today. Now, in addition to being a researcher, I'm also a professional in the field of heritage, and I thought I will have a look at a map uh, about heritage sites, and this is the map you see, and it's very easy to identify Seili on this map. It has all kinds of markings on it. That means there is very much heritage, identified objects of cultural heritage. We could take another map which shows places of natural value, of, of uh, rare biotopes and rare species, and probably that map would also emphasize Seili because it's also known for its natural values. So in the society of today, there are many, many values that, that make Seili a special place, and maybe in, because we don't conceptualize ourselves as villagers anymore, but, but in our landscape, Seili is perhaps one such almost sacred place or a place of, of special meaning. And we certainly had very, very good exchanges of thoughts there. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Rennes. I'm a PhD student in media studies at the University of Turku. And yeah, I'm gonna briefly talk about my PhD project and then kind of trying to connect it to the theme of water and to what we experienced in, in the pre-symposium. 
Uh, yeah. So the topic of my PhD project concerns the relationship between film and utopia. Um, I'm interested in the concept of utopia, most of all as a way of thinking about space. Uh, in its traditional form, utopia is understood as something like a blueprint for an ideal society. Uh, and I would like to take this idea of the blueprint quite literally, in that it's first of all a matter of organizing space. So in many classic utopian texts, the starting point in the descriptions of the ideal society is to arrange space in a certain definite way. And this spatial organization then determines the conditions of how the citizens of this ideal society can live. In this way, the theme of utopia leads quite naturally to more extensive questions about the relation between the human subject and the space that this subject inhabits. And uh, similarly, if we look at the utopian tendencies in the history of cinema, we see these same questions about space and about being in space appear again and again. Especially in early film theory, it is often repeated that cinema can offer a radically different kind of way of perceiving reality. It can create cinematic spaces that are foreign to our own human sensibility and thereby disrupt our habitual way of being in the world. Uh, one significant reference point for me in my research is the work of Jean Epstein. Um, he was a French filmmaker and film theorist who worked with cinema from the early 19, uh, sorry, from the early 1920s until the 40s or late 40s. Uh, Epstein expresses the difference between how humans and the cinematograph perceive the world in terms of movement. Uh, on one hand, Human perception has a need for fixity and stability, which is why it cuts the perceived world into discrete entities. On the other hand, cinematic perception prefers unceasing movement and continuity. And therefore, pure cinematic space provides no fixed reference points, and no centers or privileged points of view. Uh, and this idea of pure cinematic space also connects to the theme of this conference Namely, it is precisely water that offers the perfect counterpart for this type of space. Uh, and for example, uh, Epstein shot a cycle of films in the archipelago of Brittany in the northwest of France. And these films experiment with how the ocean in its unceasing movement could be incorporated in the filming process. Uh, so the fluidity of the water becomes a kind of aesthetic ideal for Epstein. Uh, one thing that is worth pointing out here is that Epstein doesn't see cinema just as a neutral instrument with which to analyze the movements of the sea in a new way. Instead, in his theoretical writings, Epstein goes so far as to describe the film camera as possessing a subjectivity and an intelligence of its own. So therefore, when a film is projected on the screen, the moving images unfold as a mode of thinking that is alien to ours. And in this way, the experience of watching a film involves a non-human thinker that thinks for us, in a sense. So therefore, cinema can be defined as a collaboration between the human and the non-human, um, where this unruly machine takes the lead and sweeps the spectator up into new ways of perceiving. And so if we look at utopia from this point of view, it is no longer a matter of instituting a fixed human order in place. Instead, it is a matter of an experimental process which decenters the human and opens up towards the non-human. And so, uh, working with early film theory, we can attempt to redefine utopianism uh, in a way that wrests utopia away from its humanist roots. And then, uh, to finish, I have yeah, a couple of reflections how this experience in Pure Symposium connects these themes. And Kind of, I already found resonant just the simple fact that we were uh, uh, residing and thinking on an island because uh, precisely islands are kind of the most typical places where utopian societies are traditionally located. And um, so one thing that kind of drew my thought is the uh, interplay between water and the land. Because uh, again, in, in traditional utopian uh, descriptions, the water functions as a certain kind of barrier that shuts out unwanted external influences 
So it, its function is kind of to shelter the island itself and the ideal society that is located on that island and uh, thereby to uh, assure that it doesn't get changed. So it's kind of by, uh, by ordering the space in a very strict manner, the uh, temporal dimension is kind of uh, stopped and the society gets a almost eternal status. And this interplay between land and water was something that um, we often kind of paid attention to also uh, during our stay in Seili. And because, yeah, there's an interesting history to be told uh, just through this interplay. Like, for example, that the water at times acted as almost uh, a prison wall, but then it also has this a function of connection and uh, and creating linkages and things like that. But yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, um, I'd like to firstly start by saying thank you to Abba Agora for welcoming me to the pre-symposium and the symposium. Thank you to Lisa as well for her, all her organisation and to Tara as well for guiding us all through the experience on the island. Um, my name's Selena Oakes, um, I'm currently studying at Alto University, doing my Masters in Visual Culture, Curating and Contemporary Art. Um, so um, I'm going to just run through a bit of recent research that I've been doing, um, mainly um, surrounding the idea of edge work, so um, thinking through edge work. Um, I'd like to kind of go through a couple of definitions um, of ecotone and edge work, two things that um, have been really relevant to um, both my visual work and my um, theoretical work as well. Um, so ecotone, um, by the Oxford Dictionary definition, is a region of transition between two biological communities. Um, so Donna Haraway, um, who Tara was al already mentioned, also speaks of ecotones in When Species Meet. Um, so she writes, I remembered that, eco that contact zones called ecotones with their edge effects are where assemblages of biological species form outside their comfort zones. Um, so the idea of different species kind of uh, playing with each other at, at boundary points uh, has really like sparked um, a lot of uh, dialogue, I think, within my own work and with other people, um, and that actually borders can be spaces of real fruition and production. Um, and going on along the same lines of the, the idea of edge, eff edge effects, um, I'd like to kind of turn the attention to edge work so edge work is a term that's used in sociology. Um, Stephen Ling uh, defines it as a concept that understands voluntary risk taking as a, as a temporary escape from social boundaries and the search for mental and or physical borderline experiences. So I kind of, I'm interested in taking um, the sociological terminology or definition of edge work and kind of re reframing it within kind of the ecotone and contemporary art kind of uh, context and dialogues. Um, so I'd like to propose that, eco, um, that uh, edge work is instead, that it takes place in liminal spaces, um, that is both a symbiosis and a friction between entities, and that it is not fixed, concrete, or impermeable. Um, so recently, um, just last year, I did a collaboration with two artists in Helsinki, uh, Ronya Hushma and Ro Red John. Uh, we worked with the Biophilia Lab at Alto University, um, basically taking samples from different microbiomes, and it was kind of trying to think of a different scale of ecotone. So thinking about the human microbiome that's, that lays on your skin as an ecotone. Um, and it's kind of the idea that bacteria, microbes, fungi that live on your skin are kind of these kind of connecting forces between you and the external world. Um, so we took um, specimens uh, from, from ourselves, samples from ourselves, also from other species, so uh, lichen, 
bilberry um, and pine to see what grew on the surfaces of all of these um, species, including ourselves, um, to make uh, comparisons, contrast and comparisons between the bacteria and fungi that we found on them. So these are some images from those findings. Um, Um, and then, unfortunately, my video is not working because it's a PDF export. Um, but moving forwards with this idea of surface, I've been really interested in um, the surface of the water and how this is often seen as a barrier between two different kind of the at atmosphere, the air, and then beneath the water. And thinking about the surface as actually like a place of activity um, and kind of fruition as well. So. These are two stills, unfortunately, from two videos, one that's shot from above the water and one that's shot from beneath the water. They're intended to kind of play with each other. Um. Uh, lastly, most recently, my research has kind of started to pay attention to transboundary borders. Um, so, waters, sorry. So these are um, uh, spaces all around the world. Um, I think there's like 262 uh, of these transboundary waters that go between uh, two nations. So um, this is a picture of Lake Papers that is shared between Estonia and Russia. And there's literally a line on, if you look on Google Maps, that literally goes straight down the middle of this amazing blue, deep blue lake. Um, and I'm kind of drawn to these spaces that you can see. This is a map of Europe where you can see all of the transboundary waters that are present just in Europe. Um, but I'm interested in these spaces of uh, the contrast between administrative lines and actually like eco ecological line, um, lines and just to see what activity actually happens um, at these borders, so-called borders. Um, so moving uh, on to my experience with Saley. Um, so in my mind, I had very much a kind of um, interest in looking at the borders of Staley um, because it's an island, um, it was a lep leprosy colony, um, it was a mental health, a site of a mental health hospital as well. So thinking about these borders, but also thinking about um, these borders as active zones, as places where things happen. So um, Lotta Petronella, um, a filmmaker who was uh, with us for the pre-symposium, uh, during one of her discussions, she mentioned exploring Saley, like exploring the skin of the island. Um, and that really resonated with me as I kind of walked through the island and was thinking about the surface of the island and thinking of it as this organ that had these, like, that had its own microbiome, essentially. Um, and that really resonated with me. And going to the so-called borders that we think of, like shore, the shoreline, um, on Saley and seeing kind of thinking about the rocks and skin and seeing the different kind of lines that were drawn by the overlapping of water onto rocks. Um, so you've got the kind of temporal line that was made maybe two hours before this photo was taken by the water and the kind of receding uh, tide as well. Um, um, lastly, I was also uh, really intrigued by the way that my own body moved around the island. So Saley is, is an island that's got um, a lot of kind of biodiversity. There's a lot of uh, different trees, lichen, uh, grass, grasslands, there's meadows, there's butterflies. And thinking about like how my own body moved through, through the landscape um, quite clumsily, unfortunately. Um, and just thinking how, um, how quite often humans choreograph land and sea, but actually the, the land and sea can choreograph us and our own movements within a space. Um, so visible choreographers like trees and lichen and rocks um, were present with me and Saley, but also thinking about um, non-visible choreographers. So we had a discussion about ticks. So ticks in a way were choreographing us on the island. We were, didn't go into long grasses because of the ticks. Uh, or thinking about ticks, so they were kind of not visible, but we were thinking about this. And also just the history of Saley as well, like thinking about what places might be sacred at different times and how you should act in a different place. Um, so it kind of, in a way, choreographed our body in that way. So, yeah, I think that's, that's me. Thank you very much. Hello, 
Um, Kari Ylianna Laimen, doctoral student from Aalto University Film Department. And uh, I have a working space in an island called Harakka in Helsinki, and I much, I kind of reflected my experience in there to sail. But there is also a, like, a, mm, well, let's see if I can open open this an idea which I would like to share. Like um, this more than human film of atmosphere, this hydrosphere in the cosmic cinema of the universe. Uh, and uh, the idea is that can we kind of uh, think about cinema as also something that more than human cinema. Um, so there are traditions like um, expanded cinema, letrists, anti-cinema, film without film, uh, traditions and artists who kind of uh, extract the borders uh, of cinema, like um, letrist Roland Sabatier, who writes a text where it is said that the film consists of your briefing, or Ernst Schmidt Jr., who uh, like uh, advises people to throw paper airplanes and see their shadows on the screen, which is his cinema in Hell's Angels. And yellow movies are actually paintings where the color changes because the time affects it. And um, then there is proto cinema, which could be, uh, which has been seen like or uh, one hundred fifty thousand years ago, when the thousands of tiny um, characters like this are um, when the sun shines with them, they change during different seasons, different images. And uh, because of the sun, so we can enter into the circadic rhythms inside of living creatures. We can think the sun as a big projector of the cinema on the earth. And we can find philosophers' statements like Henry Bergson, who sees the world as an aggregate of images and uh, writes that by image we mean a certain existence, which is more than that, which, we, which the idealist calls a representation, but less than that which the realist calls a thing, an existence placed halfway between the thing and the representation. So basically that the image is already there in the entities and not just in our perception. And if we go into the tiniest particles of the world, like one cell creatures, like in here, in water, so uh, according to Bergson, they already reflect this uh, kind of uh, uh, or already kind of centers of indetermination, even though they don't have a consciousness or brain. So, and Gilles Deleuze, um, who wrote a theory on cinema, or maybe more like uh, wrote about <laughs> with the cinema, like uh, um, two books and invented the concept movement image which he derived from Bergson's perception action um, entities and um, also noticed that this, no, mm, uh, this notion of gap interval cut before the action is something which uh, uh, in, uh, is a cut, uh, could be described as a cut in moving image. So, um, yeah. 
are these also moving images, these one cell creatures that we see here in Percy Smith's um, scientific film from the 1931 called The World in Wine Glass. With wine glass is filled with water. And then we can, can go on back to metacinema. And this is a quote from Deleuze. The essence of cinema lies in the mobility of the camera and in emancipation of the viewpoint whereby cinema stops being spatial and has become temporal. It is through the camera that we have come to live in a universe that is metacinematic. So we are quite quite much in the same realm as my colleague <laughs> who told about the utopia of cinema is very close to that. Then, uh, yeah, well, about the water. So the botanist philosopher Emmanuel Coccia sees the plants as the titans who built the world for, for us. There are, and uh, that uh, actually it was born in water. The plant is basically the leaf and the roots and arm of the plant comes later. So uh, there is a strong connection with hydrosphere. There and of course the whole that's what we can say about the whole world because the water flows to through us and throughout the whole world. So here's another quote from Gotcha nurturing transformation and fluidity as constant stages in life, embracing mutation and metabolism beyond their chemical and organic levels. And another quote from Astrid Neimanis, who is uh, uh, like a hydrofeminist. I'm singular dynamic world dissolving in a complex fluid circulation. So that's how is it rolling? Yes. And here is one more thing. It's um, like uh, about the uh, liquidity in um, mm, uh, that, that there is like uh, organic liquidity in uh, crystals. So the solid and liquid are really kind of um, um, also somehow indeterminate. And kinema actually if we think about cinema, it means movement in Greek. So it is not just human cinema, but everything that moves. So that's more than human film of atmos uh, our uh, film of atmosphere, hydrosphere in the cosmic cinema of the universe. But this is a quite a local film in the Milky Way. <laughs> yeah. Now I have to close this. There is no sound, or oh, it's very, very s slow. Yeah, and it's out for the video.
sound cable on. Do you have the video also? Yeah. Uh, in the same space, yes. could we sell separately? in folkloristics at the University of Turku. Uh, water is a central element at rock art sites, and I will next show you two ways how they are interrelated. The singing that you just heard uh, is part of my field work at the Lamasjärvi rock art site. Uh, I have tested the soundscape of the rock art sites at over 100 sites uh, so far. And every site that I have been able to test so far has had an exceptionally good echo. Often it is exactly the reverberation of the singing that uh, differentiates the rock art site from the other cliffs. So we can say that echo is central, if not decisive, part of rock art. Now, why does echo matter? Um, the rock art sites resemble in many ways the Sami sacred fishing, Siedi, Seita in Finnish. And Echo has been central at Siedi because the spirits were communicated by singing and drumming. Singing and drumming uh, also help to end the trance, and that has been central at Siedi. Um, this is also called Sonic Drive. But it is not only the people who enjoy singing with echo. The Sami say that also the animals can yoik. And I share next with you the morning concert of the red-throated loon um, that are singing with echo at the Olhava rock art site at 5 o'clock in the morning. But it's not only the sound that is reflected by the water. Um, also, the paintings are connected, in, uh, connected to water. Most of them, over 90%, are situated uh, on cliffs that are directly by the water. And it seems that the paintings were also painted right above the water level. Why was this the only right place? from many other sites that you could paint them. Many of the fishing siedi are located on lakes that are called uh, sacred, saiva. And uh, the people who had passed away were taught to continue their living in the bottom of these lakes in a mirror-like world. The Sami communicated with these saiva people by singing. And they also gave offerings to them to this mirror world upside down. Now, if you look at the paintings in a good weather, you can see that they are reflected to the water upside down. I will next share an, ex share an example from Varicalio rock paintings with you, where you can see how the vibration in the water is reflected uh, back to the cliff. And the paintings are 
vibrating together with the paintings in the water. And uh, this vibration uh, starts to dissolve the border between the cliff and the water, and it leads the gaze towards underwater. Now, if this is the place where the dead people lived, it may be that the paintings have been part of communication with the underwater world. Mm. We have now seen two ways uh, how the water is connected to the rock paintings by the reflection of the sound and the reflection of the paintings. And these two natural feathers construct the rock art sites uh, effectively as liminal sites, where singing, drumming, and painting may have aid the mind to enter the altered or deeper states of consciousness. And um, it may be that uh, rock art sites have been central in a similar way as the Sierra sites in maintaining the relations between the human beings and the other nature. And the reconstruction of this relationship may be central to our future as well. My experience about uh, Sally uh, was very much a healing one. It's a very contested island, especially by the human behavior there and the history. But um, the nature is so strong in the island that uh, it just reminded me of the strength of nature to be maybe the biggest healer. Unfortunately, we also saw the um, effects of the climate change there and uh, kind of this uh, very contradictory situation where we are now. But it also reminded me that we all have the chance to go to the forest, to go to the nature and uh, have some healing there and work together with the nature. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so you got a little glimpse of, uh, and can imagine how many different kind of connections actually there were in the conversations, what were found. There was a lot of sort of navigation on that kind of liminal spaces in different ways. And um, But before we, um, I, I'd like to share with you a little bit of the, uh, um, if I find my presentation again, um, of my, um, of, of our, what we did, um, kind of our, to go back to the island through actually our activities and, and, and share a little bit of some, sort of give you a snippets of some of those thoughts and emergent kind of um, ideas that we discussed. Um, oh, now this is working automatically. How do I stop that? How does it, um, if it starts going automatically, what do I do? Okay, let's see. Just, uh, so ask us if any man goes to me, guys, at the end. Let's see. Um, then I'll have to speed up. Um, and also, um, this is obviously where we started from, image from the Turku Harbour, when we're leaving from, um, with the boat from the river. And I wanted to put this up here because it's obviously the kind of journey, the, the movement from the city to the island was meaningful in, in a number of ways, um, but also a reminder of how um, the islands and the archipelago and the archipelago sea has been always an integral part of culture and the development of culture in, in this particular part of Finland. Um, and, and how Turku has, is where it is because of the uh, marine connection to the world, to, the, uh, uh, to Sweden and beyond at the time. Um, and, and how this, um, this sort of artery, the rivers, the sort of arteries of, of, of the land um, are also the kind of connections uh, to across the globe through the seas. Um, and, and how the different kinds of environmental changes that are happening are connected through this. Uh, these arteries in complex ways, um, this is the kind of the rivers are the main you know, so, uh, routes for uh, the overload of nutrients from our agriculture to be uh, uh, affecting our sea at the moment. Um, and, uh, but also this is still a kind of point of connection where people travel to and from. 
Um, and, um, and as you can see also, the changes, the cultural changes are very much present when you look at the old harbour areas, anywhere in the Western world at least, uh, where you can see how, um, how the kind of from the shipping and building, we're moving to uh, the real estate business, for example, as you can see here. Um, but then we arrived on the island, um, and this is um, more or less looking towards the direction of, of Turku, um, on the kind of one of the highest uh, sort of viewing points um, on the island, uh, where you can actually look, you know, Turku is kind of there on towards the uh, right uh, of the image. Um, I would also here like to kind of um, tell you that I was definitely not kind of uh, leading or guiding uh, the group, uh, but we had... Um, guides with us in a way, who have a lot longer and, and deeper connection to the place and knowledge. So here's uh, Ilpa Vornen, who's a, um, who was the director of the Archipelago Re Research Institute for over 20 years, um, and also worked, came first to the island in the 70s when he was studying marine biology here at Turku University. Um, so there's a lot of pictures of Ilpa waving, at, uh, pointing at different directions, uh, but also in the picture there you can see Lotta Petronella on the, on the right, um, who will reappear in the pictures, um, who's an artist and filmmaker who's been working very, uh, also closely with me and, and thanks to whom I've been started working on the islands over 10 years ago um, and, and who's been doing research for a number of years now in Sailly. Um, and, um, and so the kind of when... The rock and the sea was sort of starting from there. Uh, one of the key things that we ended up also discussing a lot were, were this connection between um, the line, the shifting line between the rock, the island, the land, and the sea, the water, um, because of the kind of geology and, and the way that the land is rising. Um, so how um, the 400 years of institutional history of, of hospitals uh, on the island, within that time, uh, the land has risen two meters. So the island is actually used to be a number of islands when first the first hospital and the church was built there, uh, rather than one island. Um, and this is something that uh, in the one person's lifetime is not a, uh, maybe so visible a change, uh, but in, when we look at the histories, even the recent histories, it's really affected, it's very present on the island. So the land is, const at the moment, uh, the land is still rising faster than the sea level. Uh, with climate change, of course, we don't know how, um, which way it will go. Um, but the land is rising so much that uh, there is clearly new land all the time. So actually the, the plants, the, the life on the land that seems to be rooted and grounded is constantly actually on the move and claiming new land. Um, uh, while the sea and the kind of the marine environment and ecosystem is retreating. Um, and um, also we have, uh, took a number of these pictures here because um, our kind of the starting point was really of how do we engage with this change? You know, how do we engage with these different kinds of changes that are uh, have very different temporalities, and, and we don't necessarily, as humans, you know, in our uh, our sort of uh, sense of time, uh, is quite out of sync with geological time, for example. Uh, it's very difficult to relate to that. Um, so how do we uh, how do we kind of um, how do we make sense of these changes that are happening in the environment? Many of these changes are kind of invisible to us. Uh, let's see, you know, for example, under the sea, uh, the surface of the sea, there's a lot of things happening that, uh, that are beyond, uh, without a, a lot of technology we have actually no access to, uh, to sense uh, visibly or through other senses. Um, and, um, and, but also the kind of temporalities affect that. Um, and so we, um, we were kind of, um, everybody brought their own different methods that were quite intuitive at times, you know, of kind of how, do we, how do we relate to this place in a very short moment like this. There was, uh, some were taking photographs, I have to say that less than usually when I'm there with artists, there's a lot more photographing and videoing going on than now. Uh, but there was quite a bit of sitting and lying down and, and kind of uh, feeling our way around in different ways, listening uh, played a big part. Um, and, uh, and, and so, and as you heard from the different, um, different research questions that the participants of the pre symposium brought with them, uh, there was also a lot of thinking of how uh, water, how the sort of atmospheres and hydrospheres connect in different ways, how, how the kind of um, water and air currents, for example, are, are have planetary connections. Uh, but we also talked about the invisibilities of, um, through science, uh, through, how, uh, through the microscopic, for example, how um, we were talking about how if um, this, where, where this performance with water 
um, that here the water is probably so chemically uh, treated that there's absolutely nothing living in it. Um, but we don't see it's transparent. It seems that it's nothing. Uh, but obviously the nothingness of also uh, a sample of, of the Baltic Sea can actually be a teeming soup of different kinds of forms of life when looked through a microscope. Uh, so the understanding of where our, the limits of our, our kind of vision and, and sensing um, and, uh, and how the sort of borders of our bodies are crossed in different both directions also with the different sort of waters um, that we don't actually know very much of what's there uh, and or the kind of we cannot control completely. Um, so we talked about also water bodies as kind of the way that we are water bodies. We are 90% water. Um, and, and we're constantly also kind of, there's a fluids coming, going through us constantly. And it was interesting this morning, we kind of, these watery con conversations have continued. This morning we're talking about somebody having had a migraine yesterday after not drinking enough water uh, during the day. And we thought that we actually, probably none of us drank enough water when we were there in Sailly. It was very hot and we were walking around a lot. Um, and we also talked about toilets and the kind of water closet as this sort of insanity of, of in our modern culture of how much clean water we flush uh, in our toilets constantly and these sort of nutrient cycles um, in, in, in the kind of, uh, that are really crucial, for example, soil um, health uh, of how our kind of culture um, now uh, we are taking nutrients out of this sort of environment and cycles constantly, while, for example, with the Baltic Sea, we are pumping too much nutrients uh, through our agriculture and, and particular kind of practices. So we're kind of, uh, there were these ins and outs from our own quite sort of multisensory um, uh, being and our own professional practices to these sort of wider questions throughout these days. Um, and here's Ilpo again pointing, this time with a prune, we couldn't find the kind of the, uh, whatever you call the stick that you use usually for maps, uh, so we found a prune instead. Um, so just to kind of um, give this um, reminder of the islands and, and how, how the landscape is changing, and you can only imagine that this map looked, would have looked quite different 400 years ago, for example, if you think of two meters of, of land rise. Um, and, and how actually when you start looking at, again, the scales, of, of, of looking and engaging, of when we go from the microscopic to a kind of, uh, to a sort of more bird's eye view um, or the plane's eye view, uh, you start noticing patterns that you obviously don't notice otherwise the same way. As you can see, the, how the ice age is actually somehow present, the retreating ice is present in the way that the land form has been formed here. And we talked about this also meteorites. Um, these are round circles that are visible from, uh, from above, where you can see where most likely meteorites have hit. Um, and obviously we walked a lot, uh, and, and we visited the different buildings. Uh, there is the church um, on the island. Um, there's, uh, the kind of history is very present, um, so um, we definitely kind of engage with that in different ways. Um, talked about the wood, the carpentry. Of, of kind of how the church was built and how, how, um, how the wood was transported and, and thinking about these different kinds of changes that have been happening and the kind of practices. Um, there was a lot of this kind of, now when I looked at photographs, I got photographs from Jannika and, and from uh, Jon and, uh, and then there's some of my own pictures and there was a lot of these sort of like borders everywhere. Like here we're looking at uh, peeking through the sort of boundary inside the church where the, where the, uh, uh, the lepers uh, were basically kept on a different side, they had a different entrance than the rest of the islanders to the church. And here we are kind of peering through and navigating or trying to make sense of these borders from, from the present perspective um, in, in different ways. Um, here's another picture of us again, leaning on a fence, you know, and kind of, uh, and, and sort of uh, pointing this time towards the, uh, um, um, uh, the cemetery. Where, um, where there's only a fraction of the bodies that have, you know, of the dead on the island have been buried and are buried in this, what is now the cemetery, but actually there's, a, there's this sort of lost border. It's not, we don't actually know where these different sort of burial areas have been historically. So this kind of also, we talked about the sort of shifting, shifting kind of baseline of, of what is it that we know and what do we relate the present to and, and, and whether it's in environmental terms and conservation, what, what would you remember as the natural state uh, or can consider as natural state? 
and, and what, what is, for example, conserved, uh, but also historically that there's a lot of layers um, that we don't know. Um, and this is the main um, hospital building um, that is now the research station and also um, part of the hotel and restaurant that operates there. Um, we spent a lot of time on this yard eating a lot. Thank you, Lisa. You had uh, booked us a lot of coffee breaks. <laughs> so we had to rush in between the eating and the coffee breaks to, uh, <laughs> to run around the island. But it was good. You know, we probably did drink enough water after all. You know, it, it was really nice. Um, and here we are at the inside. The, um, uh, again, <laughs> here we go, Bill, Bill pointing. Um, at this time at the a scientific poster. And I wanted to bring this up because the, um, one of the things that uh, we discussed quite a bit um, was the, in terms of the changes, the uh, a time series that they've been um, collecting at the Archipelago Research Institute for decades now. Uh, and the time series now are actually showing uh, through modeling, they show how the um, salinity of the Baltic Sea is uh, lowering, like in the, in the archipelago sea there's less and less salt in the water, uh, which uh, is caused by the increase in rainfall uh, that is predicted to get you know, worse uh, with climate change. And, and due to this, the plankton and the herring, the sizes are, are, have dramatically uh, got smaller. Um, so. Um, that kind of, and this can be actually compared to graphs of climate change uh, um, and, and global warming graphs that are com totally um, connect. Um, and, and so we talked about time in these terms as well, of how do we observe and take time? What, what does it take? What kind of commitment and con uh, you know, uh, situating your practice and your observations in the site to kind of gain that kind of knowledge of this? these sort of uh, slower changes that are actually ex accelerated at the moment. We also talked about, back to this idea of the body, um, the water bodies, um, that our bodies are not directly feeling the change of salinity. Unlike the herring, the herring is growing smaller, the plankton is growing smaller. Uh, while their bodies are having to adjust their own salinity to the changing environment. Uh, at the moment, the uh, Baltic Sea at the, here, around Turku is about the same, uh, uh, this uh, level of salt is about the same as in our tears, which is actually corresponds to our bodily fluids. Uh, but this is changing. So imagine being a plankton or herring having to adjust to that change of salinity. Um, and then there were some wonderful traces of, of, of kind of field work causes by uh, scientists uh, in, the rear, on the, uh, in the lecture room. and. Uh, and, and this kind of, I just took this image from, uh, from the, that as a kind of reminder that um, this sort of decentering of the human, you know, or kind of, uh, or sort of the remembering, we talked quite a bit about how do we kind of remember to, the human as part of the multi-species community of the water or the soil or the island, um, that, um, that the Homo sapiens is also uh, part, of, part of this kind of complex um, changing ecosystem. And here's Lotta pointing. Um, uh, the, um, Lotta Petronella, filmmaker, was talking about her, her work um, and, um, and particularly what I think stuck with, uh, as we heard already, if, um, that there were a number of things that came from that, but also the kind of particular the notion of haunting, um, haunting as something um, that is a social phenomena, understood as a social phenomena, not as a kind of circum a personal psychosis or, or, or kind of... Um, or some sort of um, pre-modern uh, superstition, for example. But thinking about haunting as, as a way of knowing, as a transformative way of knowing, or coming into contact uh, with transformative knowledge. Um, the question is about what is missing in the archives. What do we not, what can we not read there? Whose stories are not there? And what are the narratives that are not written or visible to us? The gaps, the limits of knowledge, and the silence or the forgotten. And, and how do we engage with that and recognize that in our, our work? Uh, how do we look for that and, and, and so that our pre-existing, situated and always partial perspective and knowledge does not actually blind us to things, especially when uh, things are very much in change. Um, um, we walked around um, in, in different parts of the island and, and thinking about the changing, the kind of water land um, sort of changing relationship. This is a swamp uh, that at the moment is definitely not a swamp. It's very dry um, and it's quite high up. Um, 
And it was interesting to think of that, how this environment is extremely different later on in the autumn when there's a lot of, or in the spring, when there's a lot of water around. Um, and how that kind of these mini kind of micro ecosystems are changing constantly on the island. Um, but also there were um, findings of, of places um, that, um, that there were kind of, um, here's Ulla and, and Ilpa, and together with Jan, you were kind of um, identifying and finding places that probably could have been some sort of um, um, sacred or revered sites um, that, that we don't have, uh, that have not been researched, you know, clearly. And, and we don't know, but the kind of sites that could have definitely been that. Um, and, um, and for example, this is one place that has been found and identified there, these cup, cup stones um, that were only found just over 10 years ago on the island, um, next to a shed, you know, and, uh, and a well, and, and kind of in a, next to a barbecue place where, by chance, the marine biologists having a barbecue sort of started looking at, like, what is that on that rock, you know? And, and, and the interesting thing here is, too, that it would have been right next to water, uh, hundreds of years ago, like now it was in land, but the water is actually um, would have been there right next to them um, at the time. Um, Iron Age, am I right? Potentially Iron Age, cupstones. Um, but we can. I'll throw the ball back at the uh, experts soon. Um, and um, and another border, um, the kind of. Um, there's a lot of fences, and, and, and it reminds me in the archipelago, remember that the fences are there to keep the animals out of the yards, not, the, not to kind of keep the animals in the kind of fenced area usually. And here as well, you have the kind of cows that are taking care of the, us, and that's their summer job is to basically keep the old meadow ecosystems um, in, in, in sort of place. And there was this, at the moment, this time, the cows were kind of engaging kind of quite a lot over the fence, trying to eat things from the side of the hosp old hospital yard. Uh, and also, um, as was mentioned, there's a lot of visitors to the island now, day visitors, and also kind of there's a hotel. Um, so here's, we have an encounter also with a kind of, with a visitor taking a photograph and a kind of a summer resident, the cow, um, staring back, you know, and, uh, and, and and there was that constant sort of action. So we're also thinking of these different ways of visiting, different ways of um, entering and, and lingering or inhabiting a, and being part of an ecosystem. How we uh, talked then about the visiting, how do we visit with care as researchers or as, as tourists, you know, how, how do we, um, how, how, how knowledge is connected to care, how we need to care in order to know and we need to know in order to care well, and how, how this um, also connects to our kind of research as we kind of touch upon places. Um, here's the guy trying to eat the, uh, eat the bush from the other side of the fence. Such, you know, human-like activity, honestly. You know, don't we all do that all the time? Um, and we talked about this, um, we also talked about trees. Um, the different sort of time uh, scales and what the trees might have seen and known on the island. Um, and in the end, towards the end of the two days, we are uh, uh, with Anna Dernros Remes uh, from Opo Academy, marine biology uh, professor. Um, with her, we talked about the um, sense of place in, in biology now and also uh, particularly connected to this idea of ecosystem services um, and how, the kind of how, how there's different ways through different disciplines to try to value give value, often even kind of give a price tag to, um, to kind of um, to emphasize why we need these environments, why, why are they sort of, why is it important and necessary to protect uh, certain natural ecosystems. Um, but, so we discussed and then we discussed quite a lot about how, how do we pay back, you know, if we're thinking these sort of monetary terms, how do we pay back, you know, to the environment, all that it gives us? Um, or um, how, you know, how, what is it that we give back? You know, what is, how can that be? It can't, we can't think about it just one way, that we're gaining services, you know, from, from the kind of environment, you know, and ecosystems. Um, but um, how can we think of that codependence of our, ours to uh, the other, other than human um, beings in, uh, in, in our environments? Um, and, and for example, kind of, uh, how can we think of, for example, water as a community that we're part of? not uh, simply as, as some matter or an ecosystem, but actually a community, and what kind of care does that demand of us then, um, and in kind of reciprocal care. Um, and then we went, 
off we went after two days or less than two days with all of our baggage in, in, in every sense of the word. Uh, here we are traipsing about again, uh, finding our own path, actually going to see the copstones with all of our bags on the way to the ferry um, to, uh, um, to get back to the uh, city. Um, but this was it from our little journey. Um, and um, I don't know what the time is now, let's see. Okay, so we have a bit of time for questions. And, uh, and I thought that there's probably, you probably have questions, but I would like to throw one question to the group um, as, a, uh, as a sort of, um, to connect maybe to some of the other conversations that have been had here at the symposium um, about the, um, how, um, what did you um, gain from each other? Because the kind of multidisciplinary dialogues, I think for us it was really crucial and really important to have, have these uh, um, different, very different perspectives, you know, and approaches to this environment. Uh, but is there anybody who would like to, um, like to kind of say something that kind of stuck with you from, from your conversations with each other. Well, um, uh, oh, I can remove it, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I found a discussion since we had two uh, film researchers with us which is a completely alien field to me. But I was fascinated by, by the thoughts that Kari brought out about the extended cinema. And one thing that I really started to think about is, is visiting a place, going to a place, and going to an island is an excellent example as, as actually a form of cinema. That was a, a refreshing idea. Um. Well, I, I would say that I was particularly and very pleasantly impressed of how, um, how different we are, but despite this difference, it was such a great pleasure to talk to each other. And I would, I would say that even through these discussions and maybe these discussions, there's, there's, there was the most important thing that I gained through the performance and, sorry, performance, pre-symposium and performance as well. And um, it's always surprisingly fascinating and it's so, wonderful that despite different uh, perspectives, it's always possible to find the common language. The, the, yeah, and um, I believe that I still need some time to process what I gained after the performance and who knows how it will unfold in my artistic practice. Thank you. I'm <coughs> um, just for me, like I've had very little contact with uh, folkloristic and folklore so um, that was a really interesting field for me and another layer I think to um, add to what what is sometimes I think I feel with my visual practice is that it can be slightly cold because it is mainly digital media um, so yeah I think for me that that was a, a good a nice kind of the nice conversations that I had so yeah Uh, I was surprised how many kind of uh, rhizomatic connections there were, like uh, with other others, which were wonderful. Well, I was kind of um, pondering in my research the connection between the science and the art, because if I think my own subject, it is from a very holistic culture. And so this group was a very good possibility to kind of think how they can be intertwined in your perspective, because it's one world and it cannot be like looked at only from one point of view. Yeah. I kind of thought about the whole experience as, a, as an interesting experiment in the kind of philosophy of space and the philosophy of place, because um, everybody has had this um, very unique way of um, approaching place and uh, taking a certain kind of methodological way to interpret it and study it, and then just think about the interplay between these different perspectives and how, how the 
kind of sense of place arises more from the differences rather than trying to reconciling all the points of view. Yeah, thank you for your talks. Um, <clears throat> I have a general question that came maybe from Alexis and Karis and also maybe a bit Taru's presentations. There seems to be this common theme of, of the non-human or uh, criticism of anthropocentrism. Uh, <clears throat> you talked about the camera as a non-human perception or how you want to put it in, in your different ways. Uh, and Taru talked about a kind of, I don't know, imagining a perspective that is non-human or being in contact with something that's not human. But the, the, the st it seems I'm, I'm missing something here because it, it becomes like, what, what, what is the problem with talking about this as human perspectives? I mean, the, um, the camera is still modeled on human perception, not a dog's perception or something else. I mean, it's, it's a machine that is modeled on our perception. It records, and recording is a human practice, and it communicates, which is also part of our communicative practice. And the scientific perspective on nature uh, is a very human practice, and it, its its aim is to bring maybe something that's beyond mythology or beyond our beliefs and so forth, some kind of empirical knowledge, but that is still, that sort of endeavor is still a very human, human sort of practice. So I'm just wondering what, 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 what do you gain by talking about the non-human? Where does this inspiration come from? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can just make a small comment about um, how Epstein thinks about the camera. It's, he sees um, it as a sensibility unlike anything else because it has the uh, ability to communicate between different perspectives and change between different perspectives with regard, for example, um, speed manipulation and, and reverse motion and things like that. that um, Film camera has the ability to view the world from many different scales at the same time, and that is what is, according to Epstein, unique in, in film and the kind of uh, non-human ethics arises from that specific power. Yeah, I prefer the concept more than human because it kind of includes human and tells about that the human technology and human perception is something that is still uh, kind of, a, I don't know if result is the right word, but it's a, uh, from the material of the world. So basically, it, it, yeah. so, uh, and for me, the uh, cinema of atmosphere or film, uh, because I think the cinema is the universe, the movement is there, but the life on earth is kind of a film for me, and uh, the human, all the human activities are possible because it is as it is. I, I, I don't know, but not non-human, I also maybe I, I prefer more than human because Maybe also kind of, um, maybe I used the non-human at the end, but uh, um, the natural cultural, the emphasis on the natural cultural, that this is actually the kind of core and, and with decentering doesn't mean uh, actually kind of doing away with the human perspective or the, um, but, but really kind of um, thinking about um, for example, the kind of question of community, that if we approach an ecosystem rather as a community uh, that we are part of, that we are, you know, as an extremely heterogeneous community, um, that then what does that mean in terms of the kind of ethics, for example, of, of, of us as 
as part of a community where, uh, where we cannot uh, have um, a kind of, there's no centered kind of one uh, kind of perspective or the kind of human perspective that can somehow capture it all or, or kind of understand or, um, so I guess that's the kind of, yeah, I think non-human is kind of problematic as a term in that way. We could continue this discussion for a few days, so I <laughs> Any more questions? <clears throat> well, thank you, all of you. Very inspiring talks and presentations, and really reminded me as an educator, as part of the world of the future contemporary artists, that how important the multidisciplinary work is. And also, the senses of Sayli was kind of a like a, in a core of Abakora, presenting the importance of multidisciplinary thinking and dialogue. So my warmest thanks to all of you. <laughs> and now we will have again a coffee break, but this time a shorter one for 15 minutes.